So in this video, the relationship between tyre force and tyre slip, slip pull curves if you like, uh, some words on friction circles, or traction circles if you prefer, a brief foray into ABS, and some words on how to tune the handling of a vehicle using anti-roll bars. Let's go. So first of all, tyre force versus tyre slip. Now, tyres which are developing their force through friction, which is most tyres as far as we're concerned, increase the amount of force that they can develop as their amount of slip increases. But there is a point at which the tyre reaches its maximum tractive force. And for most tyres that happens at about 20% slip. Now usually when we're talking about slip, particularly in off-road vehicles, we usually mean longitudinal slip how much further the tyre is rolling compared to how far forward the vehicle is moving. But slip can happen laterally as well. So when the vehicle is cornering, you also develop a slip force. And the same rule is true, that the maximum force develops at about 20%. We can plot the amount of force that the tyre develops against the amount of slip that it's experiencing in what we normally call a slip pull curve or a tyre force tyre slip curve. And that looks like this. Now this curve is pretty typical for uh, tyres on tarmac. So you see that we have a peak at about 20% and then the amount of force that the tyre can develop drops off fairly significantly after that. On gravel or on any loose surface really, soil or whatever, uh, the situation is similar in that we still develop maximum force at about 20% tyre slip but we don't see that very distinct uh, drop immediately after the maximum traction point or after the maximum force point. It's one of the reasons why vehicle handling on gravel tends to be a bit more predictable than it is on tarmac. When you start to slide, you don't suddenly get a big drop off in, in tire force. The other thing that you'll notice about this curve is that the, the gravel line is rather lower than the tarmac line. And that's because the amount of traction available on gravel is a bit less than it is on tarmac. So next up, let's talk about friction circles or traction circles. The idea of the friction circle is that it provides a description, a mathematical description, of the amount of force that the tyre is able to develop. So you'll see at the top of the circle we have pull or acceleration. So this is longitudinal force that is accelerating the vehicle. At the bottom we have braking force, on the right we have turning right, and on the left we have turning left. Now the diameter of the circle corresponds to the height of that maximum force point on the slip pull graph. So the tyre has a finite amount of force that it can generate in all directions. So if we're accelerating, or if we're drawing a load, you know, pulling something behind the vehicle, then we can basically keep on uh, generating more and more pull up to the point where we reach that maximum pull point at about 20% slip. Now on tarmac, if we go beyond that, actually the amount of pull available will start to drop fairly steeply. Now the same is true for braking. When you're braking, you can generate an increasing amount of braking force up to the point where you reach that peak force point and then the amount of force will start to, to drop away. On tarmac, that's quite pronounced. On gravel, rather less so. And the same is true for steering. So if you steer to the right or steer to the left, then you can generate uh, more and more steering force up to the point where you reach the, the limit of the traction that's available, where you reach the limit of the tyre force that's available. The thing that the friction circle allows us to do is work out what happens when we have more than one force acting at the same time. So for example, if you're braking going into a corner, what happens? So we can see that as we increase braking force, we can carry on braking harder and harder until we get to the, the limit of available tyre force, and that's fine. So when we're steering, we can generate more and more steering force so that's the force that's pulling the vehicle around the corner, up to the point where we reach the maximum force point at about 20% slip. Now if you brake and steer at the same time, you're asking the tyre to produce two sets of forces, one steering force and one braking force. And those forces add together, and they add together in a geometric way. 
So what we see is while we could generate maximum steering force or we could generate maximum braking force, if you add those two together you end up with more force than the tyre is able to generate. So if you brake in a corner you'll find that the vehicle will probably tend to understeer because it can't generate the amount of braking force and steering force at the same time that it needs to steer the line that you've commanded. So what's this got to do with ABS? Well, because of that very rapid drop in the amount of force the tyre can produce as it slips more, we would like to be able to get up to that 20% or so maximum force point and then keep the tyre there. So if you brake very hard, if you slam the brakes on, what would normally happen is the wheels will lock up and you'll get to 100% slip very quickly. So you can see at 100% slip, you're generating a lot less braking force than you would be at 20%. So the job of the ABS system is to monitor how much wheel slip you have and to slightly ease off the brakes to make sure that the tyres stay around that 20% slip point to ensure that you're maintaining the maximum braking force. What that also means is that you can carry on steering because you haven't saturated the friction circle by locking up the tyres through braking. So you can continue to produce some steering force. We can change the size of the friction circle by changing the amount of load that the tyre is carrying. So if we increase the load on the tyre, the size of the friction circle gets bigger. So what that means is we can get more pull, or indeed more braking force, from a heavier vehicle. So the change in the size of the friction circle is not linear with load. So here we've added on about 20% load, and you can see that the slip pull curve has moved up a bit. Now if I take off 20%, from the, from the normally laden uh, condition, you can see that it drops down a bit more than it went up when we added 20%. So adding 20% gives you less of an increase than removing 20% gives you a decrease. The reason tyre force doesn't vary in a linear way is because of the way the tyre distorts as it's loaded up. So at its intended working load, you've got a nice evenly distributed force across the whole contact patch. If you reduce the load on the tyre, the tyre starts wanting to be round in two dimensions. So the contact patch starts going round and the size of the contact patch, both um, along its length and across its width, starts to reduce. The tyre basically lifts up off the surface. Conversely, as you increase the load on the tyre, what tends to happen, and I've exaggerated it slightly in this diagram, but what tends to happen is you start carrying more and more load on the side walls of the tyre, and the contact patch actually starts to lift away from the surface. So you end up with two very narrow tyres that are pressing very hard onto the surface, rather than one nice wide tyre that presses down evenly across the whole width of the tyre. This has significance for the way anti-roll bars work, and this is the way that we can tune the handling of the vehicle using an anti-roll bar. So this is an anti-roll bar. An anti-roll bar is a torsion spring uh, that runs across the width of the vehicle. Um, it has no effect on the vertical dynamics of the axle, so it doesn't add to the spring rate at all, doesn't stop the, the axle from going into bump and rebound. It only has an effect when the vehicle tries to roll or when the axle tries to articulate. So the anti-roll bar, which is the red bit you can see, is connected to the chassis via the black brackets and is connected to the axle or to, to the suspension arms in an independent setup via those yellow links. So as the vehicle rolls, the anti-roll bar twists along its length and resists that rolling motion. And what it's doing is transferring load from the inside wheel to the outside wheel. So if you have a vehicle with very low roll stiffness, like one that has a trunnion axle, like a tractor, there's no weight transfer from the inside wheel to the outside wheel. So both of the wheels carry the same amount of load, irrespective of how much body roll you get. If you have an anti-roll bar, you have weight transfer from the inside wheel to the outside wheel. 
Now, because the size of the friction circle doesn't vary in a linear way with the amount of load that the tyre is carrying, as you transfer load from the inside tyre to the outside tyre, you find that the overall amount of grip available actually reduces. I mentioned in the previous video that understeer is usually considered a benign condition, much more benign than oversteer. So it's very common, particularly on passenger cars, to fit a front anti-roll bar, partially to control body roll, but mostly to reduce the amount of lateral grip of the front axle so that you always end up with an understeer condition. But you can use anti-roll bars both at the front and at the rear to tune the handling of the vehicle to vary how much under or oversteer you get. Now in competition vehicles, rally cars for example, you might have adjustable anti-roll bars front and rear so that depending on what surface you're on you can actually modify the behaviour of the vehicle to, to decide whether it's going to oversteer a bit as you might want to in uh, a forest rally or understeer a bit as you might want to on tarmac. So quite a complex topic today, but it's worth bearing in mind that friction circle theory is the basis of all of the science behind vehicle handling and suspension tuning. So understanding this will allow you to start understanding how suspension affects the handling of the vehicle. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more off-road vehicle engineering content. Thanks for watching.